is Greg Brzezinski, and I'm going to be the moderator for today's event. I'd like to thank uh, both our in-person audience here at the Elliott School, as well as those who are joining us uh, virtually via Zoom. Uh, today's talk is part of the SOJP lecture series for the GW Institute for Korean Studies. The GW Institute for Korean Studies was created in 2017. And since then, it's emerged as one of the premier sites for career-related events and discussions in the Washington, D.C. area. In particular, its focus is on trying to create a better dialogue between policymakers and scholars uh, on career-related issues and trying to have better integration between the humanities and policymaking on uh, career-related matters as well. The SOJP lecture series is an important part of GWIX's activities. The lecture series brings distinguished speakers from around the country and around the world to give talks on their research and on their perspectives on Korean Peninsula matters. It is a particular pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Benjamin Young, uh, partially because he was once one of my PhD students here at the history department at the George Washington University. And since then, he has gone, gone on to do some very great things. In particular, he's published his book with Stanford University Press, Guns, Gorillas, and the Great Leader, which talks about North Korea's policy towards Afro-Asian countries during the Cold War. And he is currently, his current position is Assistant Professor of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness at the VC, the Virginia Commonwealth University Wilder School of Government and Public Affairs. Please join me in welcoming Professor Benjamin Young. Thank you very much, uh, Greg. I appreciate that. And it's also nice to be back in DC. I actually haven't been back here since uh, 2018. Uh, so things are relatively the same, I would have to say. It's just that uh, everyone wears masks now. Um, so I uh, want to uh, also take the moment to just say thank you for having me. This is actually my first in-person book talk. Uh, all my other book talks have been uh, solely via Zoom. So what I'm going to be talking about today is part book talk, uh, but also part uh, of an overview about my next research project. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, North Korea, third world liberation, and the exploitation of mountain insurgency. So I'm going to be talking about uh, kind of the environmental and military history of North Korea and why it kind of builds off of my previous research project. Um, so first off, this is part of a uh, larger book project that is just beginning. It's definitely in the nascent phase and examines the military and environmental history of mountains in the communist world, uh, China, North Korea, Cuba, Southeast Asia, and Eastern Europe. Uh, and my basic premise is, why did the communist states that survived the collapse of the Soviet Union, why did they survive? What was unique about those systems? And one of my theories is that it has to, it has to do with their formations, the fact that they were guerrilla struggles that were constructed originally in mountain areas. And so it built an internal kind of resilience and ruggedness to those regimes. Uh, and this is kind of an interdisciplinary project uh, as Greg had mentioned, I uh, have my PhD in history, but I'm now in an interdisciplinary program called Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness. Uh, so it kind of, uh, my project bridges environmental history, military history, and international uh, relations. Uh, and specifically, I come, uh, I'm talking to you today about North Korea uh, and that has been my primary focus in the past, and it still will be, but I'm kind of broadening out to more uh, communist countries. And despite the importance of mountains in North Korea's political culture, there's actually been little in-depth research that has traced the intersection of the environment and politics 
in uh, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. The exception being that uh, a geographer Robert Wood Stanley's work has been uh, quite important in looking at the importance of uh, revolutionary geography. Uh, so for those that are tuning in via Zoom or here in person, I'm very welcome to comments, suggestions, criticisms, because this is a new book project. Uh, so uh, I would look forward to your feedback. So it's been actually uh, about a year now since I published my first book, Guns, Gorillas, uh, and the Great Leader, North Korea and the Third World. And my project uh, looked at North Korea's relations with African nations, Latin American nations, uh, Southeast Asian nations, uh, and it really traced uh, North Korea's national identity to being a third world as country, kind of a new conception of how North Korea viewed the world. Um, and in my book, I, I basically have four main themes. Uh, the first being that inter-Korean competition has shaped North Korea. Uh, the fact that North and South Korea struggled for legitimacy uh, during the Cold War era and that North Korea has actually never rescinded its goal of dominance of the peninsula. Um, the second theme of my book is Pyongyang's support of national liberation struggles and post-colonial governments, and that North Korea's leadership sympathy derived from their own guerrilla experiences. Uh, so in a lot of Cold War history, we learned about the Soviet Union and the Cuban government support of national liberation movements in Africa, for instance, but there wasn't a lot of research done on North Korea's support of those movements. So my book was one of the uh, first attempts to trace that uh, support. And I basically, I, my, my argument is that North Korea supported these movements because Kim Il-sung was once a guerrilla and he identified strongly with these guerrilla movements. So he had a sympathy for them. Uh, the third main, the third theme of my book is that North Korea saw itself as a third world model. Now that seems crazy, right? That North Korea could see itself as a model. Uh, its economy is uh, quite weak, but up until the mid 1970s, North Korea's economy uh, was just about uh, was ahead actually of South Korea most uh, economic indicators. So there was a genuine belief in the North Korean leadership that they could be a developmental model for other third world nations. Uh, and my last uh, point in my book was that Kim Il-sung forged personal relationships with other post-colonial leaders, uh, from Robert Mugabe to the Cuban revolutionary Che Guevara. They all went to Pyongyang and they formed close relationships with Kim Il-sung. And uh, the North Korean propaganda apparatus, they promoted Kim Il-sung as this world revolutionary leader on par with Marx, Engels, Stalin, uh, Mao. And this was kind of uh, a way for North Korea to forge their own uh, kind of path in the Cold War world. Uh, so that's a bit about my previous book. Uh, and my book still builds off of that, this idea that North Korea was a leading anti-colonial state that Pyongyang's independent streak and commitment to self-determination resonated with many third world peoples who had recently uh, overcome Western imperialism. Uh, and North Korea, they uh, have never, they have always had a very close relationship and alliance with post-colonial states. For example, they're still a member of the non-aligned movement today. And uh, my, next book project, it takes a look at guerrilla movements. It takes a look at the intersection of geography uh, and political culture. And this is an outline of what I'll be talking about. Uh, the main argument is that mountains serve as a political pillar of the Kim family regime and cultural output. My project examines the ways in which the North Korean government uses mountains as a marker of legitimacy that helps to maintain the Kim family regime's iron grip on power. So I'll be talking about a comparison with China and Cuba. I'll then de delve into the anti-Japanese guerrilla struggle as a foundational epic of North Korean ideology. I'll talk about Mount Paktu as a unique revolutionary heritage site. I'll talk about the use of the Korean, uh, the use of mountain shelters during the Korean War and how this made North Korea into a subterranean state 
And then I'll finish with contemporary relevance. Um, so I, uh, when, I, when I first was thinking about what to do for my next book project, I know I wanted to go beyond just talking about North Korea. North Korea is a very interesting and fascinating country. Uh, but after writing a book about it, I wanted to learn some more things. And I've always been very interested in the history of communism and socialism, but I'm also very interested in climate change and environmental history. So this was kind of a combination of the two. And when it comes to Cold War international history, uh, the environment and the climate has really not been uh, studied much. It has been under-researched, under-analyzed. Um, and I thought it, that was peculiar considering that many of the most powerful communist states, for example, China, uh, they were originally forged in mountain areas. So they provided cover for guerrilla movements in the early anti-colonial struggles to leaders serving as sources of legitimacy. Mountains were important sources of armed struggle and commemoration for many radical regimes. So mountains were not only physical spaces, but also important mediums of ideological rejuvenation, mass mobilization, and nostalgia. So from Mao Zedong's long march to Fidel Castro's guerrilla warfare in the Sierra Maestra, mountains served as revolutionary spaces for a number of governments during the Cold War era. Um, so Cuba, China, and North Korea, they all kind of have a origin story, a foundational epic. And their foundational epics really tie into the rugged geographical terrain of their mountainous regions. For example, Mao Zedong, he really built up his legitimacy and his uh, propaganda uh, image via the long march of the 1930s when Mao moved northward to escape the Japanese colonialists. Uh, and Edward Snow, the very famous biographer of Mao uh, and very close kind of uh, ally to, to Red China during this period of time, uh, he had this quote, the journey took them across some of the world's most difficult trails, unfit for real traffic and across the high snow mountains and great rivers of Asia. So Edgar Snow's writings helped to really forge Mao Zedong's image around the world as this great revolutionary warrior. And he, one, one of the ways in which he did that is he tied in the roughness and the ruggedness of the terrain of the Long March. So it made Mao into almost this uh, populist style leader. Meanwhile, in Cuba, Castro also built up his reputation uh, via uh, basically being the leader of the guerrilla struggle in the Sierra Maestra. Uh, and Fidel Castro in 1960, he had a fairly famous speech in which he promised to continue making Cuba the example that can convert the Cordillera of the Andes into the Sierra Maestra of the American continent. So it was this exportation of the guerrilla mountain struggle into other areas of Latin America. And North Korea, they also had their guerrilla struggle that was tied to mountainous regions. For example, Kim Il-sung in 1931, said the Tumen River area is full of steep mountains and deep valleys and dense forests, and so forms a natural fortress, difficult for the enemy to attack, even with their modern weapons, but easy for a guerrilla force to defend. And um, one, of the, uh, one of the reasons why I thought this would be an interesting project is when I was actually a postdoc at the US Naval War College, we were learning different military theories. So we learned about Clausewitz, Sunza, but we also learned about Mao. And we learned about why Mao was important for military strategy, his focus on asymmetric warfare, small mobile units. And I thought that was interesting because we also learned that Mao's people's war was something that was adopted later by jihadists and other uh, insurgents. Um, similarly, Cuba, Che Guevara's Foucault theory was similarly adopted by third world insurgents. But what about North Korea? Why isn't there a guerrilla tradition and strategy tied to Kim Il-sung's persona? North Korea, they were able to uh, basically fend off the Americans during the Korean War. Uh, Kim Il-sung su successfully uh, defeated the Japanese 
uh, colonialists, obviously with a lot of help from the Chinese communists as well. But why wasn't there a guerrilla tra tradition tied to Kim Il-sung? Did North Korea attempt to export this kind of tradition of military strategy? These are some of the questions that I wanted to answer. Um, so some of this is also based in military science and military strategy. Um, so the interna internationalization of Mao's People's War and Che's Foucault theory. Uh, and these guerrilla strategies, they depended on the natural environment for cover and strategic shelter. Mountains allow insurgents to hide and conduct ambushes on enemy forces. Uh, conventional military forces cannot scale mountain size. And that, uh, they were mountains were ideal locations for small, smaller mobile units. And within the uh, academic discipline of history, military history has, has kind of gone by the wayside. Uh, it's definitely not as popular as it used to, but I actually think there might be a renaissance and revival of military history with the Ukraine crisis. And we see that actually conventional warfare and studying insurgencies is important for the 21st century. Uh, and in a lot of my classes, I talk about, you know, Yes, cyber war is important, uh, cyber resilience is important, but we need to not forget that wars happen and there's still some uh, strong men out there like Putin who are very comfortable with launching large scale conventional wars. So uh, even though this might be not in vogue right now, I think actually military history is important to study. So my project uh, not only covers environmental history and international relations, uh, but also military science and military history. Um, so North Korea, its revolutionary story begins in the 1930s. Uh, this is talked about a lot in North Korean propaganda, the anti-Japanese guerrilla struggle. This is when Kim Il-sung's guerrilla band, uh, they became uh, the regime's core leadership. This is what scholar Wada Haruki terms the guerrilla state, The North Korea later adopted the ethos and mentality of the guerrilla fighter and basically tied it uh, to the regime's identity. And so by tracing the North Korean revolution directly back to Kim's guerrilla past, the leadership in Pyongyang, they promoted Manchuria as the birthplace of the DPRK state. And so uh, there has always been a very close relationship between the Chinese communists and the Korean Workers' Party. Uh, sometimes I see nowadays in mainstream news outlets that, oh, China and North Korea, they don't have very close relations, but I actually think uh, they benefit from each other, and that's a relationship that's going to last long into the future. And one is, yes, North Korea provides a buffer state to China, but also they have a built-in history, uh, geographically and also in terms of their revolutionary stories, the fact that both sides helped each other during their kind of anti-colonial struggles. Um, and during the 1930s, it was Kim Il-sung who saw the mountainous areas along the Tumen River, uh, which bordered China and North Korea as a prime base for military operations. Uh, later, Mao actually told Kim, if North Korea were to fight the US, then the Dongbei region would serve as North Korea's rear base. If China were to fight the Soviet Union, the Dongbei region would be the front base and North Korea would be the rear base. So almost this elasticity of territory and borders. We think of today as China and North Korean borders as being very, uh, very strictly controlled. And while that is somewhat the case, uh, back during the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, that region was a lot more porous than we would think. Um, and unlike the Cuban and Chinese guerrilla struggles, Kim Il-sung's resistance movement began in exile. Uh, the border areas between China and North Korea are not rigid, but rather flexible spaces in the hinterlands of both countries. Uh, in the, during the Korean War from 1950 to 53, Chinese and North Korean troops, they used mountains in the DPRK as refuges from the US air bombing. Obviously, we, many of us have heard stories about the U.S. air bombardment during the Korean War, uh, the fact that U.S. air bombers, uh, they returned to their bases with the bombs intact because they couldn't find any other infrastructure to target. Uh, and Kim Il-sung, he viewed mountains as the primary ter terrain in which the war could be won. They couldn't 
uh, compete with U.S. air bombers, and so he thought we need to take we need to make use of our mountainous terrain. So in a February 7th, 1952 speech to regimental cadres in the Korean People's Army, Kim said, you should be skilled at mountain warfare and night battles. We can say that battles in our country, which is mountainous, are a fierce struggle for the occupation of hills which lie between friends and enemies. He added, therefore, you should wage skilled mountain warfare to wrest away the enemy occupied hills one by one and move forward step by step. So during the Korean War, mountain warfare became vital to North Korea's military strategy. Uh, in North Korea, they even had poems that celebrated uh, the regime's uh, kind of attachment to its rugged terrain. So this was a, a poem called My Hill. Uh, and the poem goes, hills stretch across our land like blood veins. These chains of high and low hills, our hills, find them, O noble heart devoted to our fatherland. And note the sacred blood stains, which every stone mark and every crevice fill. Climb them, and you will understand the heroism and of free Korea, the undefeated will. Of life and death, you'll understand the meaning. If our Korean hills you climb, our hills. Uh, even today, in uh, North Korea and South Korea, there's still a deep attachment to hills and mountains. Think about South Korean hiking culture. If you go on the weekend to any mountainous uh, region in South Korea, there will be uh, people in their hiking gear with their hiking sticks. There's kind of a deep attachment to mountains. Uh, in North Korea, there's pilgrimages to Mount Paktu. Uh, there's, there's also uh, there's a connection to kind of mountains. You could say that Koreans are mountain people in, in some respect. And for the North Koreans, there was also this attachment to mountains because they protected them during the Korean War. Um, so mountains, they were sheltered during the Korean War, uh, and they made North Koreans into subterranean people. This is actually a, a quote from Bruce Cummings' book. Uh, the fact that North Korea now, many of its military facilities are likely underground. Uh, North Korea is uh, quite, uh, they have quite a few experts that engage in tunnel building. There has actually been some reports that North Korean experts have helped Hezbollah and Hamas build tunnels. Uh, so uh, you could say that they were their subterranean people, and the Korean War and the brutal U.S. air bombardment made them that way. Uh, and for practical purposes, North Koreans, they also used mountains as cover for industrial production and road construction during the Korean War. And it was in mountainous regions where North Korean mass mobilization and collectivism was on full display. Uh, U.S. air bombing also decimated North Korea's agricultural production. So North, K North Korean people did what they could in order to avoid mass starvation at the end of the war. As the Polish embassy in Pyongyang explained in July 1953, for hundreds of kilometers, one cannot see even a scrap of uncultivated land. Even high mountain slopes and deep bomb craters are even being used. Uh, so mountains became one of the first spaces in North Korea where the mentality of self-reliance, later known in official North Korean discourse as the Juche ideology, was implemented on a grassroots level. Um, and I like this quote here from the Polish uh, diplomat Deporinsky. Uh, he actually visited a North Korean tool factory during the Korean War. It was embedded in a mountain. Uh, and he said, quote, the factory is built high up in the mountains. A huge piece of the mountain was cut out. The wooden hull is again covered up with soil and the slope of the mountain is the roof. He had it naturally such a factory is dark, stuffy, without ventilation. The workers are the workers are working there with great eager, eagerness, fully understanding the importance of their effort to the victory. So the Korean War was uh, very important for how North Korea later used uh, their mountainous terrain strategically and to prepare for a future uh, possible U.S. invasion. Uh, Mount Paktu is a bit different because it is something to do with the Korean culture and the traditions that surround kind of the origins of Korea. Uh, so Korea or Mount Paktu has a mythic status within Korean culture, the birthplace of Tangum. Uh, Mount Paktu also shares the border with China and North Korea, and China is known as uh, Changbai, Changbaishan. Uh, and due to its sacredness in, North, in uh, Korean traditions, the North Korean propaganda apparatus, 
apparatus. They portrayed Mount Pekdu as the primary site of the 1930s anti-Japanese guerrilla struggle. So is that actually true? Did most of this, did most of the struggle actually take place in that region? Most likely not. Uh, but they made sure to portray it as such because there was such a traditional attachment to Mount Pekdu. And this mountain, it serves as a political pillar of the Kim family regime. Uh, for example, Kim Jong-un, he is frequently referred to in North Korean propaganda as being part of the Pekdu revolutionary bloodline. Uh, if you go to Kim Il-sung Square in Pyongyang, there is a sign in that square that says uh, Pekdu revolutionary nation. Uh, Pekdu is something that is frequently uh, kind of part of North Korean slogans. Uh, there's even, I believe, some commercial products like Mountain that has the Pekdu uh, name attached to it. So uh, Pekdu-san is definitely part of North Korean mythology. Uh, and according to North Korean propaganda, it was Kim Il-sung's partisans who established a base near Mount Pekdu and launched guerrilla operations from that zone. Even the song of General Kim Il Sung, which is the most one of the most famous revolutionary songs in North Korea, it's still sang today. Uh, the song of General Kim Il Sung it begins: uh, "Pekdu Mountains roll, stained with blood, long yellow river meanders soaked in blood. Today, Free Chosun's wreaths of glory radiates its holy rays around the land." Um, and when it comes to Pekdu San, it wasn't always cordial actually between China and North Korea in terms of who would actually have this territory. It, it, it is really on the border. China and North Korea, they actually split it in half. Uh, and during the 1960s, they both claimed parts of it. Uh, but I think to actually illustrate that the relationship has gotten closer is that they really don't have any territorial disagreements now over Pekdusan and who owns it. They definitely, uh, they almost see it as a collective space. The contemporary relevance of Pekdu now uh, is tied to nationalistic symbolism. Kim Jong-un has tied his identity to the Mount Pekdu mythos. For example, school children in the military, they go on pilgrimages to Pekdu. Kim Jong-un brought South Korean President Moon Jae-in to Mount Pekdu in 2018. This was supposed to be a symbol of Korean unification in unified Korea. Ethno-nationalism binds the two Koreas together, uh, but Pyongyang has actually never retreated from its goal of dominance of the, of the Korean Peninsula. And we've seen more uh, rhetoric and discourse recently in terms of why does North Korea have ICBMs? What is the ultimate goal of North Korea's strategy? Uh, in the Rondong Shimun, there was actually, I think, a telling quote about Kim Jong-un as the embodiment of the Mount Pekdu spirit. Uh, the quote goes, his eyes reflected the strong beings of the gifted great person seen in the majestic spirit of Mount Pekdu, the appearance of a powerful socialist nation, which dynamically advances full of vigor without vacillation at, every, at any raving dirty wind on the planet. And uh, Kim Jong-un brought Moon Jae-in to Mount Pekdu, when there is a nuclear uh, test, uh, Kim Jong Un has also uh, rode a white horse of Mount Pekdu. It is definitely part of his image. It's also definitely part of North Korea's culture and production as well. There's also a song uh, called "We Will Go to Mount Pekdu," um, and uh, if you have the chance to, you can put this into YouTube and listen to it. It's quite, uh, it's quite the hit. And that was one of the, uh, the most famous songs in North Korea just a few years ago. Uh, so North Korea's political culture, it really has embraced the Pekdu mythology. And we really can't understand North Korea's actions and behavior without taking into account internal factors, including political culture. So for example, in mid-October 2019, Kim Jong-un, he wrote a white stallion on Mount Pekdu. Many Western uh, analysts believe the single upcoming nuclear test, it actually did not. Uh, on October 23rd, 2019, Kim Jong-un gave a little mentioned talk at Mount Kumgan tourist region that signaled a push for economic self-sufficiency and to wean itself off of South Korean dependency on Mount Kumgan. So this is a domestic economic policy shift. 
uh, that was ignored by most Western analysts. So North Korea, they also see their mountainous regions as tourist havens as well, as a way to attract tourists in the future. That has been one of Kim Jong-un's pet projects. COVID has definitely put uh, kind of a, uh, a hindrance uh, to those pet projects of his, but he, at the end of the day, he's only about 37 or so. And I believe that Kim Jong-un Kim Jong -un will be around for quite a while. Uh, he's also lost quite a bit of, of weight recently as well. And I think that uh, this spells that Kim Jong-un is definitely uh, quite stable and he's gonna be here for uh, a while. So when it comes to mountains as well, we can't talk about North Korean mountains without also talking about, about the fact that nuclear tests, they actually shift mountains. Uh, many of these tests in North Korea, they take place underneath mountainous regions. Uh, for example, after the September 2018 nuclear test, uh, Mount Montau moved by around 11.5 feet and shrank by 1.6 uh, feet. So resume nuclear testing, it would actually further erode the environmental stability of a fragile region. Uh, so when we think about North Korea, we usually, we usually think, oh, maybe this is a signal to South Korea. What, maybe they're not resuming nuclear testing because of uh, they want to buddy up with Trump or Biden. There's also internal factors like the ecological and environmental health. And I think that needs to be uh, addressed as well. In addition, uh, during the uh, 1990s, during the arduous march, the mass famine, there was uh, huge uh, deforestation issues. And Kim Jong-un has actually tried to address this. Uh, deforestation, it leads to landslides and flooding. It also uh, sometimes breeds agricultural issues in rural regions. And North Korea, they actually attended the 2015 Paris Climate Talks. And the North Korean Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, he announced that Kim Jong-un has declared war on deforestation, has put forward a massive project to turn all the mountains of the country into mountains of gold, thickly wooded with trees. And you see this, um, this slogan a lot, turning all the mountains of the country into mountains of gold. So Kim Jong-un has actually prided himself on being this kind of eco-friendly figure. Uh, and Mount Paktu, it's still actually an active volcano as well. Uh, and so we need to be cognizant that a potential natural disaster is not out of the realm of possibility. And that would obviously be a huge humanitarian catastrophe for the Northeast Asia regions. So that's kind of a, uh, an overview of my project that ties in uh, military history, environmental history, and international uh, relations. Um, I wanted to uh, you know, take any questions from either the Zoom audience or the in-person audience. Uh, and I wanted to thank you all for attending uh, during the last few days of the semester. I'm going to uh, start off a little bit by abusing my privilege as moderator and asking the first question. And so, um, you know, I thought this this is, you know, absolutely just very, very interesting talk. And, um, you know, I actually had a lot of thoughts about this, but I guess if, if I were to sort of um, not quite push back, but sort of a question on sort of the direction this may go, right? And comparing China and North Korea, because you were, you know, I think you started off saying that mountains are, you know, important in the communist world. And the places that you're looking at are North Korea, China, and Cuba. Those are sort of the examples that stand out. And, you know, I would certainly agree with you from a strategic perspective. Um, if you look at the Chinese, case as well as the North Korean case, um, it's very clear that mountains were, you know, very important to the survival of Mao Zedong and the CCP uh, during the Long March and, um, you know, during the subsequent struggle against the Kuomintang. But if you look at the mythology, I think it's a little bit different. It comes out a little bit different in China and North Korea, because in North Korea, you know, I think there's just such a heavy mythologization of Mount Pekdu and its role as sort of, you know, one of the revolutionary birthplaces. Whereas if I look at, 
communist China, I'm, I'm not sure if there's any sort of specific mountain. And you could even say that it's really in, in Chinese mythology, it's the countryside. Like that's really the birthplace of the Chinese revolution. Now, I don't know if that's, that's not really a question or, or, um, or, or um, you know, a critique so much as it is um, something that you'll have to think about if you want to make uh, a sustained comparison. And, you know, I think you may sort of, you know, you may want to think about like, you know, what are you primarily talking about? Is it the strategic dimension of this or the, uh, you know, the mythology dimension? Yeah. I um all right. All right. Um, so I you know I get I I I think that's a very good point and something that I'm gonna definitely gonna have to uh, kind of tease out. Um, because when you think about the history of communism, the Soviet Union, they saw the birthplace of their revolution being in the factories, right? It was the industrial worker that was gonna be the vanguard. China comes in and says, no, it's going to be the peasants. It's going to be the countryside that's going to be the kind of the cradle of the revolution. North Korea kind of tried to occupy both of those spaces, uh, but they also had a special place for their mountains. And a lot of that ties into, I think, Korean culture, Korean traditions, the fact that Mount Pepdu uh, was also the birthplace of Tangun. Um, and so that's definitely something I'm going to have to tease out and um, perhaps kind of emphasize that I'm talking about mountains from a strategic perspective here, because for North Korea is definitely more in terms of the mythology. Uh, for China, uh, the countryside, the rural areas um, was important. But I think, but it was also the mountains were important for Mao as well, because for example, the let's go down to the countryside uh, movement was also let's go down to the countryside and go to the mountainous areas. That sometimes actually gets cut off of it. It just gets shortened to let's go down to the countryside. Uh, and Mao always reserved a special place uh, for the Long March. For example, during the Cultural Revolution, Red Guards actually, uh, they would trace the steps of the Long March. And there was actually some Red Guards who went on uh, mountainous pilgrimages, mountainous hike, and, and they died because they didn't realize how arduous it was. Um, so I guess in terms of like the mythologies, I will, I will have to definitely talk about the fact that during the Cultural Revolution, Red Guards retraced Mount Steps and really emphasized that. Um, but I, I've always kind of felt it was really interesting and one of the reasons why there was a Sino-Soviet split, the fact that the Soviet Union said the industrial worker, the factories was the kind of the home of the revolution. China says it was the countryside and North Korea, I think they would say it was the mountain that was kind of the birthplace of the revolution. Okay, um, thank you. Um, so let me uh, go first to our in-person audience. I see uh, Darcy has a question. I have a bunch of questions, but I'll just, um, including some questions on your book, but I'll, I'll, I'll just focus on your, your lecture, which is really, in oh yeah, sorry, I'm Darcy Drown, I'm the postdoctoral fellow here at T-Books. Um, and so I guess I have two questions. Um, the first one is, if, okay, we have a moment for phrases. Looking at this idea of the mountains and their role in war fighting, um, I would just kind of pose like an alternative or I'd like to see how you respond to this is that in the cases that you're putting forward, they're also, I believe, coinciding with a time of like state formation in a sense, right? These, these countries are coming into being. It's not just the nations and the mythos around it, but also the state. So they kind of, you know, use the vagarian control of monopolization of violence over territory. They're doing that project as well as fighting uh, outside sports in some cases. And so I wonder how does geography and that state formation process interact? I know a colleague of mine at Johns Hopkins is looking at what he calls geographic circumscription. So the fact that there's mountains means the state can or cannot you know, penetrate into the, the, the periphery. So I wonder how much does that factor into these strategies? And then the second one is, it's like a partially formed thought, but I'm just kind of want to play um, the other side is how do how do mountains also serve as sites of insecurity or 
secrecy, right? Because when you're talking about war fighting, there is like a, a, an insecurity that's all, along with that too. The fact now that North Korea does house its immensely important nuclear weapons programs underneath the earth, it also, it's both security, but also insecurity because it has to hide them because like strategically, if they're found, <laughs> right, it's, it's, it's security would be compromised. So just those two yeah. thoughts. That, I, I, that second question there is something that I think is really interesting, right? Especially with the uh, use of Google Earth and satellite images now, the fact that North Korea is trying to de definitely disguise some of their military facilities. And one of the ways that they do that is by putting things under, under the ground, uh, principally in mountainous regions. Uh, and that, that, that comes from feelings of insecurity, right? That they don't want those to be targeted. Uh, we have also seen that they also made their, uh, some of their missiles uh, definitely more maneuverable. For example, having missile uh, tests come from trains, for instance, um, and all of these kind of unique uh, North Korean peculiarities in terms of how, how kind of innovative they are militarily. Uh, in terms of your first point, the state formation, um, I, you know, that's a very good question and uh, something that I will have to uh, take up in my project. And I guess one of the reasons why I decided focusing on mountains was important is the Indian Chinese um, conflict recently in the mountainous Himalaya regions. That was definitely kind of brushed over during 2020 because pandemic and yada yada, but that could have definitely spilled over into large scale military conflict. We weren't really focusing on that because it because uh, of COVID and other things happening, but that was that could have been that was two nuclear powers that had a territorial dispute. And it why was that region which is in you can't live there, it's inhabitable, un, uninhabitable. Um, why was that important? Well, the Himalayas are important spiritually for both India, especially for India, but also for China. Also, China has staked its claim of being very strong uh, supporter of territorial integrity. They don't want anybody coming into their space. They're a, a big defender of national sovereignty. Uh, so I think that mountains are not only important in terms of eco ecology, environmental health, but it's also important in terms of territory. Uh, so, in terms of state formation, I'll, I will have to definitely do more research on kind of the, the history of that. Okay, well, let me take a question from our um, online audience. And I'm going to read a question. I, I think this is from uh, one of your uh, junior colleagues in the history department, uh, Catherine Hevyanyan. You may remember her. Um, so Catherine asks, uh, thank you for your great and interesting presentation. And she has two questions. First, how does the North, how does North Korea teach its people about the legendary founder of Korea, the myth of Tangun, someone, uh, someone who was supposedly from Mount Hektu? So that's number one. And number two, is would you be interested in examining Mount Hektu and Tumen River from the bottom up? Uh, for instance, the meanings of Mount Hektu and the Tumen River to the ordinary people of North Korea. Yeah, so there's been a really big, I guess, push in the academic discipline of history to look at the everyday and kind of like uh, social history from the bottom up. Um, How do we research North Korea? We look at this archival document. Uh, but that also comes with a certain kind of uh, gaze and everything is you know, jolly and happy, it's all great. So to get a bottom-up history of North Korea is very difficult. Um, there's only one, really one archive that is somewhat genuine in terms of North Korean uh, opinions, and that's an archive uh, from the 1945 to 50 period that is at the uh, at College Park, Maryland, and at, uh, in the National Archives. Uh, Susie Kim used those uh, archival materials quite a bit for her book. Um, but I, I mean, I, to be quite honest, my 
book is really top down. It really is taking a look at kind of, uh, I'm really focused on uh, military history, how did Kim Il-sung view the mountains, uh, and in terms of how North Korea, how they teach about Tangrun and the birthplace of Korea. Uh, what is really emphasized though is Kim Il-sung. He is seen as really the savior of the Korean nation. That is really where Korean history starts. They, so Tangun, it might be mentioned, it might be talked about in some of the elementary and secondary school curriculum, uh, but there's revolutionary history classes and that begins with Kim Il-sung in the 1930s in the anti-Japanese guerrilla struggle. But there's always a, there's always a problem when you're uh, researching North Korean history because you don't want to just regurgitate, regurgitate North Korean propaganda. Right? You just want, you don't want to just spit it back as, as fact. So you have to read it against the grain. So that's one of the hard parts of conducting re research on North Korea. Okay, are there, are there other questions in the live audience? Uh, uh, yes. <clears throat> Bruce Houston, uh, I just have some small, uh, short questions. Is our North and South Korea equally mountainous? Um, I am not sure. I, I, um, well, then I feel better if I didn't know. <laughs> Say again. I feel better because I didn't know either. Um, you know, when I went to North Korea in 2012, I was actually blown away by how beautiful North Korea was, the geography and the terrain. Uh, similarly, I actually studied at a Buddhist school in South Korea uh, once upon a time. And I was also similarly taken away by how, by how beautiful it was. So for me, uh, looking at mountains was also something because I'm just personally interested in hiking and outdoor culture. Uh, but in terms of you know, uh, how mountainous a country is, that's hard to quantify too. Like how do you actually, how do you actually qualify what a mountain is? So when I view mountains more as a concept rather than a really uh, strict definition as to what a mountain is, I'm really looking at the, uh, the, the spiritual use of mountains, but also the military use of uh, topography generally. Well, on that nuclear test, you said the mountain moved. You mean it like flattened out another meter or something like that? It, it shifted because of the nuclear blast, yeah. So Shif shifting one the, one way. Yes, correct. So when a nuclear test there has there's ecological damage as a result of that. So there has been some some um, there's been some questions as to whether North Korea they they have not resumed nuclear testing because they're worried about uh, the ecological health of those regions because each time you conduct a nuclear test in the ground there's going to be uh, problems with uh, the environmental resilience and health of those areas. So, um, but then again, I don't think Kim Jong Un, like, yes, he's eco friendlier than his predecessors, but at the end of the day, it's still a military first regime. And I wouldn't be surprised if he restarts nuclear tests within the next year or so. Definitely also because North Korea, they've gone down on the international list of priorities for the uh, Biden administration uh, and North Korea likes to get uh, back into the international news headlines and recapture international attention. They seem to have a good knack for doing that. Okay, thank you. And I'm, I'm gonna take, we actually have quite a number of questions coming in uh, from people watching the event virtually. So I'm gonna take a couple of uh, questions from people in the online audience. Uh, this question comes from Adam Bubanich, who is the program coordinator for the National Resource Center at GW. And Adam asks, is one of the reasons that the Juche ideology has had a difficult time exporting itself to other countries and or states in comparison to Maoism and others due to its ethno-nationalist nature? From what I understand, Juche places a lot of emphasis on the sanctity of the Korean people, while Maoism does not. Um, so North Korea did try to export Juche uh, around the world during the Cold War era, and there's still actually active Juche study groups and uh, a lot of developing countries. They frequently get mentioned in North Korean state-run media. Uh, and there's also been a lot of scholarship done on what Juche means. 
and I think of Juche as more of a utopian concept. It's an ideal, an ideal to get to a, a really self-sufficient, self-reliant Korean state. And the only way that you can achieve this purely self-reliant utopia is by reunifying the two Koreas. Uh, and I actually, I, that is my own conception of Juche. This is what I think uh, North Korea is trying to get at. So why did North Korea fail to export Juche, unlike China, which actually was quite successful exporting Maoism, for instance, is that I think a lot of it does go back to the fact that it's a nationalistic, chauvinistic uh, ideology and is really tied to the Korean context, this idea of utopian self-reliance. Um, so yeah, I hope that uh, answers the question. Uh, thank you. So um, yeah, let me let me bring in one or two others. Uh, some of these are our are, are colleagues um, in the Elliott School. Uh, so so let me um, let me just bring in a few other questions from online. Uh, this question comes from uh, Celeste Arrington, who is of course a professor of political science and international affairs in the Elliott School. And Celeste asked this: To what extent are mountains just a cue or shorthand? Uh, for the original core regime elites shared experiences that help define who is in and who is out? Or are mountains having some independent or more direct effect on authoritarian resilience, uh, such as learning survival or surveillance skills in tough conditions? Do you think it is helpful to distinguish the symbolic mythic effects of mountains versus the actual practical effects of mountains? So that is a very, that's a very good question. Uh, and in terms of like, uh, I think teasing it out because this is a very early uh, project that I'm just getting into. Uh, that's something that I'm gonna have to differentiate because I do kind of intermix the, these two concepts nor the use of mountains as kind of spaces of authoritarian resilience but also the myth mythological value. Uh, and in North Korea, definitely the back to bloodline is seen as like, a, this is a core identity for the elite, the political elite, and the political elite in North Korea, uh, they keep the regime afloat, they, are the, they have the uh, primary stakes in the survival of that brutal uh, dictatorship. Uh, so is Pak Doon just kind of a marker, kind of almost like, um, you know, a, Another way to say, you know, the beltway elite, so to speak. Uh, I could say hmm, there, there's something to that, perhaps. Um, but I also think that when it comes to mountains generally, uh, they built a certain resilience and ruggedness into these regimes. Uh, and it doesn't surprise me that the regimes that survived the collapse of the Soviet uh, Union were regimes that originally, uh, they were originally guerrilla mountain, guerrilla struggles that were forged in the mountains. Uh, so that is kind of a uh, kind of a concept and argument that I'll have to develop a bit more. Okay, there's still more from the online audience, but let me just uh, take a quick uh, look. Does anybody else here in our in-person audience have a question? Yes, Sean. Um, thank you for your talk. So I'm Sean Dolan, the program manager here at the GW Institute for Korean Studies. Um, you touched on briefly that North Korea also kind of has an economic or tourist interest in some of these mountains. I, I'm curious if in any of your research, um, what your insights are on specifically Kungonsan Mountain, because that was traditionally, as you mentioned, you know, an area where there was a lot of cooperation between the North and the South. And then I believe it was earlier this year, maybe late last year, the North destroyed the hotels that the South had built. And so I'm wondering, do you see North Korea potentially revitalizing that area, that mountain on its own or other mountains for tourist purposes? Or what do you think um, North Korea's interest is in, in exploring tourism further using the mountains? Well, I think that right now, North Korea is really focused on keeping COVID out of the country. They have had a really uh, severe lockdown, uh, perhaps the most severe lockdown out of any country in the world. Uh, and when they say that there's zero COVID cases in the country, I actually Think they might be correct that there has been zero COVID, zero COVID cases in the country. Uh, is that sustainable in the long term? Uh, most likely not. Uh, in terms of actually uh, having foreigners come into North Korea for tourist 
uh, purposes. Um, I mean, I think that's that's up for debate. Prior to COVID, I would say no, they really wanted to develop their mountainous regions for tourism. Uh, now, I'm not so sure. There's always been a association of foreigners with being disease carriers in North Korea. Uh, for instance, North Korea has said that there is no, uh, there's no presence of HIV AIDS in the country. And actually in the 1980s, I found some North Korean public publications that said uh, Americans brought HIV AIDS into South Korea, which is why it's there, but it's not here in North Korea because we're, we're the really the pure-blooded uh, Koreans. Uh, so there's always been an association with foreigners and disease in North Korea. Uh, and I think we have seen that not only with COVID, but also during the Ebola crisis. Ebola was happening way over in West Africa, but North Korea still shut its borders down. And I think that tells you something about the way that they view uh, diseases, but also the way that they view foreigners. Uh, so do I think that they would actually prioritize uh, mountain based tourism over keeping diseases out of the country? Most likely not, but uh, Kim Jong-un was definitely prior to COVID interested in developing tourism. Uh, for example, building airports, building the infrastructure for uh, some of these some of these pet projects. Okay, um, I'm gonna go back to uh, some of our questions from the virtual audience. Uh, this next one comes from David Hall. And David is an MA in North Korean studies at the University of Central Lancashire. Lancashire. Uh, my, my British pronunciations aren't uh, too good, I'm afraid. Um, but um, let's, um, let's look at his question. Uh, David asks this, uh, thank you for your talk today. I found it very interesting. One thing you did not discuss is the inherited colonial dimensions of political mountain culture in North Korea. You drew comparisons between China, Cuba, North Korea, but did not mention Imperial Japan. The mythology of Mount Pekdu can be compared to Mount Fuji and Emperor Hirohito also rode a white horse uh, pictured like we have seen Kim Jong-un doing. Brian Myers has previously discussed this, but you, uh, could you also offer some comment? Thank you again. Yeah, so in terms of North Korea, uh, and the fact that they have definitely adopted some of the propaganda themes from Imperial Japan. Um, but also North Korea, they pride itself on being an anti-colonial state, an anti-imperialist state, which is a large part of what my uh, first book talked about. Uh, North Korea has always had one foot in the social second world, but another foot in the anti-imperialist third world. Uh, and that is primarily uh, what I focus on. So. Um, but there's always kind of a like a transition from uh, colonialism to post-colonialism, and and we have seen post-colonial uh, states take some of the administrative and institutional legacies of those colonial states to the uh, post-colonial uh, kind of systems. So it isn't totally with like without precedent. It's not something totally unique. Uh, so I, I, it's a very good question and. Uh, they uh, must be quite late, also in the UK, so I appreciate that as well. Yes, the the the, the one the one interesting thing about doing these, you know, with a virtual audience is you do you do get people from um, you know all, all around the world. Um, are, anyone else from the in person audience with questions? Um, okay, go ahead. Oh yeah, I'm from uh, MA fellow at the UK. Um, so my question to you is. Um, <laughs> oh, I forgot a uh, mic existed. Um, my question to you is, um, because I know North Korea still, like, even today, like, involves itself in, like, conflict sometimes. Like, I think Libya, Syria, Yemen, like, they're, like, somewhat involved. Um, how successful do you think they've been? Because, um, like, I know, like, in the past, like, um, I, from what the photos you've shown, it seems like they were much more, like, I guess, like, it was much more well-known compared to nowadays. So I was just wondering about your thoughts on um, current modern-day North Korean military adventurism. Thank you. Yeah. Um... So it really shifted under Kim Jong-il. Uh, pr prior to Kim Jong-il, Kim Il-sung, he sent military experts and advisors all over the developing world to help some of these uh, anti-colonial movements. Um, now, North Korea only does it for money. 
Uh, and so North Korea, they helped to build some of the military facilities, for example, in Syria. Uh, there's also been some reports that North Korea has helped uh, Hamas and Hezbollah, also uh, Sri Lanka's uh, Tamil Tigers. Uh, so why does North Korea do this? One is they like to instigate uh, Western powers, but two, they also get uh, some money from it. They get hard currency and they're a heavily sanctioned regime. So they'll just about do anything for money these days. Uh, but now what we've seen is with the uh, COVID-19 lockdown, where is North Korea getting its money? It's getting its money from its hackers. They have actually really uh, targeted cryptocurrency exchanges. Uh, and there's been quite a few reports that have come out that North Korea, North Korean hackers have been very active in the last few years and they're targeting cryptocurrency. Um, so there was a recent report, I think, published by the Wilson Center that looks at how does North Korea actually take those that cryptocurrency uh, money? How does it actually go towards the regime? Uh, because North Korea is keeping a flow, and it's not as if, uh, I, yes, things are not great there. Uh, there's still significant malnourishment, but it's not like the 1990s, even though it's had this harsh lockdown. So where's North Korea getting its money? It's getting its money from its cyber army. Uh, it's getting its money from its hackers who are actually quite sophisticated. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why the US uh, government, uh, specifically the State Department, has really emphasized uh, cybersecurity defense against North Korean hackers because they're quite, they're quite good. Uh, they, a lot of them have actually gotten training in China from some of China's top technical universities. Uh, and we see that they have been quite active during the COVID uh, era. Uh, very interesting, uh, very interesting discussion. Uh, so actually, we have a, a few more sort of comments and questions online. Uh, I'm going to read off this uh, first one. Uh, this is a more of a, an interesting comment and parallel than question, but I'd you know, be curious if you have any thoughts about it. And um, it comes from Camilo Torini, uh, or Camilo Ag Aguirre. Parini, and very sorry if I'm uh, not pronouncing your name properly, um, who is a doctoral researcher at the University of Sussex. And uh, Camilo asks, thank you very much for the excellent presentation. I would like to add something that might confirm your thesis. And that is one of the findings of an Argentinian historian and more difficult names for me to pronounce, uh, Luciano Lanare, uh, who has interviewed former Latin American guerrilla fighters. Uh, from his findings, South Americans who wanted to learn guerrilla tactics from the Cubans were introduced to the North Koreans and uh, as the snow-capped mountains of South America and East Asia were similar, at least from a Cuban's perspective. Oh, I, I, I didn't even know about that. I should get in touch with, with Camille. I know he is doing uh, really important research on Latin America. Uh, North Korea relations. And I actually think that's a that's one of the um, important kind of uh, kind of developments in North Korean history is we're getting a lot more projects now that take a look at North Korea's relations with non-socialist nations. I know there's been some uh, more projects that look at North Korea's relations with African nations. So that's one of the reasons why I'm glad my book has kind of started that. Uh, conversation. Um, and, uh, but, you know, with North Korea, it's always difficult to research that country, right? Because you, you basically only have three ways of really researching that country. Uh, first is like with the factors. So that's important for more contemporary oriented social science research. The second is archival materials from North Korea's former communist allies. Uh, and the third is media reports, whether it's North Korean state-run media, or Western uh, media reports. So it's, uh, it's a difficult country, but it's also, I think, one of the ways, unfortunately, that we're gonna research China more in the future is I think with the information blockade in China, the way that we're researching North Korea now is gonna be the way that we're researching China in the future, uh, which is unfortunate, but the authoritarianism under Xi Jinping in China is tightening uh, and we're gonna have to rely uh, more on uh, reading Chinese state-run media between the lines, uh, not actually having access to being on the ground in China because the archives have definitely been closed off uh, more and more to foreigners. Uh, so what this means is that we have to 
we have to actually have a community of sharers, sharers of archival materials. And the Wilson Center's uh, North Korea International Documentation Project and Cold War uh, International History Project is really important uh, for the continuation of the sharing of uh, some of these scarce resources. So uh, there's been some quite a few really uh, great researchers like Elias Shalantai that who has shared their archival materials uh, with that uh, organization. Uh, and I, in addition, I think that um, we might need something similar to China in the future, which is unfortunate. But I, uh, I, I think perhaps the days of archival research in China are, are done for the, for the near future. Yes, and uh, you know, before I, I you know, go back, there's one or two more questions online. Um, you know, I, I would, um, I, I would just, um, you know, add a couple, like one point and one question. You know, I think in, in the case of China, we were lucky that they were, the archives were open for a time. And so a tremendous amount of stuff of, and material was transcribed and photocopied out of Chinese communist archives. But I think, you know, you're absolutely right in that, um, you know, people were hoping that we would eventually see, you know, uh, documents from later periods in Chinese history into the 60s and the 70s, but we never got there because uh, when we were about to get there, uh, that's when uh, Xi Jinping took over and the declassification completely stopped and what was declassified was reclassified. Uh, but I, I also wonder, Ben, you know, I think you used some of these North Korean periodicals in your work and you didn't really mention them too much, I, unless they fit in with like state-run media reports. Um, you know, I don't know if I would classify all of those periodicals as sort of official publications. Uh, some of them have more of a gray category, but I wonder how you see those fitting in because I, I do think it strikes me that, you know, we've, a, a number of scholars, Andre Schmidt, um, and a couple of others are really doing a lot of research in those materials. I, I have a graduate student now as well who I've encouraged to look at those materials. So I wonder how you see those. Yeah, so like Cholima magazine and some of the Chosun Yesu and some of those uh, North Korean magazines that are like, as you correctly stated, is a gray zone, right? Between state-run media, uh, but also uh, the fact that it does come from individuals who have to uh, tote the party line, but also they have some of their own opinions kind of interspersed in there. Um, in reading, uh, getting, uh, getting, getting to look at those, uh, it's actually quite difficult in South Korea to look at North Korean periodicals during, due to the national security law. So actually, one, in, uh, in my opinion, one of the best places to conduct research on North Korea is in Washington, D.C. The Library of Congress in particular has a wealth of North Korean periodicals. Uh, so it's unfortunate that actually one of the best places to look at North Korean history is not on the Korean Peninsula, it's actually in Washington, DC. Um, so in terms of like uh, in the future, looking at the periodicals, that's definitely something I need to do. Also, I need to, uh, I can't, I, I need to make sure that this uh, next project isn't 500 uh, pages. Uh, so, uh, I wanted to not only look at North Korea, but also China and Cuba uh, and perhaps Vietnam as well. So I will have to kind of narrow what I see as uh, relevant because uh, university presses nowadays, they don't want 500 page books. They prefer things under 300 pages. Uh, so some of this is, you know, in terms of what I want the next book to look like. And I definitely want to go beyond uh, North Korea. I want to look at other uh, countries as well. Okay, well, well, this is going to be your second book, so you, you have a little more latitude on how many pages I'll let you write. A little bit, a little bit more. Um, but um, we, we have another sort of uh, pointed question from uh, somebody else in the online audience. Uh, this comes from uh, Bruce Allen Komarov, and uh, the question is this, uh, what do you think about Brian Myers' view, uh, Brian Myers' view of Jucha ideology as a sham ideology created for foreign consumption and also to establish Kim Il Sung's credentials as a great man and a great thinker on the level of Mao? Um, so, 
I have, Brian Myers has definitely uh, really changed the way I think that many people have looked at North Korean ideology. Uh, while I don't agree with all of his points, I think that uh, his work has been really important uh, for the field of North Korean uh, studies. Uh, and in terms of how he views Juche, um, I don't, uh, I don't totally agree with it, but I don't disagree with it. As I said, I think of Juche as a utopian concept, and that's something that's not talked about a lot. The fact that, that North Korea sees itself as building a utopia, a final victory of the revolution, which means the uh, unification of the two Koreas. And I think uh, Brian is, is right in saying that the uh, goal of North Korea has always been dominance of the Korean Peninsula, it has always been unification. They have never rescinded that goal. Yes, it sounds, you know, you could say some people have said uh, that's outlandish, yada yada, but just because it seems outlandish to the uh, to Westerners doesn't mean that it's not taken seriously uh, by those in Pyongyang. Uh, in North Korea, actually, I believe it was last year they uh, they revised the rules for the Korean Workers Party, uh, and they got rid of the part of the unification policy that said they were going to build unification off of a popular uprising in South Korea. Uh, and they actually emphasized they were going to actually exert control over South Korea via, via military means. Uh, and so there's actually been more discourse and rhetoric uh, amongst North Korea scholars and analysts as to why, as to why North Korea needs these ICBMs. Uh, and one could, you could actually uh, say that one of the reasons is that they want to make sure that the US does not interfere in the future in inter-Korean affairs. Uh, and for that part, South Korea, when it comes to inter-Korean affairs, they've always not wanted to have foreigners involved in that as well. So uh, his work has been actually very important uh, and it has been um, uh, definitely uh, formational in terms of how I think about uh, North Korea. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any last questions from people in the audience? I think I've gotten through most of the questions that have come in from our virtual audience. I have another question. <laughs> it kind of builds off of what you were asking. Darcy Jarrett again, GWICS. Um, so this was brought up earlier, this tension between the ethno-nationalism of North Korea, right? It's, it's institutional. It's, I mean, it's, it's very clear that that's the case. And then as you discuss in your book, your first book, um, the transnational project of the socialist world, right? The revolutionary socialism is multicultural. I mean, some of the images that you put up there are really indicative that it's this multicultural political project. So there's a tension there. Um, and so, it, you know, I, I, it was outside the scope of your first book was, was today um, for obvious reasons about data, but, how, what does this tension between the ethno-nationalism of Korea, North Korea, and the, you know, global project mean for its role in the non-alignment movement or the, the role of, you know, resurgent third world, whatever it is, like, what does that mean for North Korea's place in, not the globe, but that aspect of, of international relations? Kind of like the shift from socialist internationalism to ethno-nationalism. Um, I mean that that, that a shift. It wasn't simultaneous. Um, it's been it's been a shift largely, I believe, in the 1990s, uh, as a result of the death of Kim Il Sung, the beginning of Kim Jong Il, also the fact that their world had been shattered. What I mean by that is literally the communist bloc uh, collapsed, and so they couldn't say, "Oh, like the greatness of Marxism Leninism, like see how wonderful it is when Soviet Union collapsed." Uh, so what did they what did they kind of lay their legitimacy into? It was it was nationalism. Uh, in North Korea, it has uh, there there's always been an element of nationalism, but it just got really emphasized and heightened during the 1990s and is that, that has carried over into today. But actually, what we have seen in North Korea recently is the word uh, communism uh, has been emphasized more in North Korean uh, media reports. For example, the word communist traits. Uh, that slogan has been brought up that Kim Jong-un has actually emphasized that his people have uh, good, noble communist traits, uh, which is interesting because co uh, communism was removed from the North Korean uh, constitution, I think around like 2009. And I believe 
around 2012, they actually took down the portraits of uh, Marx and Engels in Kimmelson Square. Um, so, I mean, the fact that he's kind of, uh, why is he uh, evoking communism again? I think it's because ideological uh, indoctrination and political, political education is slighted during COVID-19 lockdowns. So I think perhaps more North Koreans are watching South Korean dramas or getting into more uh, Western cultures. So there has actually been a big push uh, from the North Korean state on ideological rigidity and re ideological purity, because uh, it seems that COVID has actually ushered in more of this cultural pollution, uh, which is what North Korea calls this. So uh, it's interesting that they actually are reverting back to communism, but this is also perhaps a way to signal a nostalgia for the Kim Il-sung era. Because Kim Jong-il is really not all, he's he's obviously, you know, the a dear leader, and you have to say how much you love him, blah, blah, blah. But Kim Il-sung is really one who's really well, who's beloved in North Korea. Um, and so there is this hearkening, this tying back of Kim Jong-un and his image to Kim, the Kim Il-sung era, to the Choliuma period. Uh, so that's perhaps why there, there has been this evoking of communism. Uh, but it's interesting, right? Because it's like, uh, it's a nationalistic regime. And then now they're invoking communism, which is an internationalist ideology. Uh, but I don't know, if, like actually delving into that is worth it because really it goes back to ideological control and the state trying to assert that control again because they've lost some of that during the COVID-19 uh, lockdowns. Okay, um, thank you very, very much. Um, I think we've exhausted all of the questions. So let me, before we end, uh, let me just, uh, mention uh, that I believe this is actually the last uh, Sujit Peel Circle talk of the year, but uh, I hope that, you know, if you're not subscribed to the GWICS, uh, the, the GWICS um, you know, uh, newsletter and email list, you will get subscribed because we're obviously going to continue with Sujit Peel Circle, uh, lect Sujit Peel Lecture Series, I'm sorry, and other uh, of our Korea Institute events in the fall. And we hope to be doing more things uh, live and in person as we are here today. And there are also going to be a number of uh, other uh, Korea Institute events. I, I think in particular on Friday of this week, there is uh, the, is it the Colo Korean Studies Colloquium, is it called? Uh, it's uh, the Signature Conference. The Signature Conference. Friday and Saturday. It's Friday and Saturday of this week. And I, I believe Friday is the portion that's open, open to the public, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so um, keep your eye open for that. Uh, I thank all of you for attending. And please join me uh, one more time in thanking Benjamin Young, our speaker for today.